Hey there, welcome back to Arden. It's nice and frosty here, but uh, we're gonna get in from the cold right away and delve into this H.R. Giger nightmare that lies before us. This door is unlocked now, which means that we can proceed forward. Into the catacombs. And boy, these people sure know how to roll out the welcome mat. Some fancy door opening there. That had to take a lot of behind-the-scenes mechanics. Oh boy. You know, I was kind of joking when I said the H.R. Giger thing, but it's already kind of... Kind of starting to look like this is right up his wheelhouse. Huh. Okay, well this makes me a little nervous. I'm- I'm already a little nervous. The door here, but we don't have the protocol for that. We won't have the- we won't have the Ar uh, excuse me, the Aria protocol for a very, very long time. The- the Aria protocol is one of the last ones you pick up in the game. Servants of the Queen scour battlefields and graveyards across the cosmos, bringing their soon-to-be brethren back to the Abyss. Within damp and gloomy halls, countless corpses are kept in stasis, awaiting reanimation. Well, I guess we have wandered into the zombie army factory. Hopefully we have the ability to shut this place down before we leave. Oh! Uh-oh. Seems like some of the patients are restless. So this level is a real kick in the junk because those enemies with the with the dual poison SMGs are back and apparently this is their hometown and we are the away team. Thankfully they do about the same damage that they did before. Like they don't seem to do more damage than the last time we encountered them. But boy, they they still are a little bit of a challenge when it comes to, um, oh, I don't know, dodging a thousand bullets at once and not getting poisoned to death. Also, it doesn't really seem like they would fit inside the coffins that they pop out of. I'm not sure what's going on there, but it seems like some kind of Schrodinger's coffin kind of thing. Magma Mall. Well, hey, that's, that's a nice companion to the Frost Mace that we've been, uh, hauling around, but not nearly strong enough to use. And hey, hey, I hear the telltale weeble wobble of an obelisk. Thank God. We got a lot of stuff to look at, and we need to, uh, we need to make sure we're ready for this upcoming area, because this is where the game gets a little bit more difficult, let's say. I don't remember what Adept does. I hope that I look at Adept, because I don't remember what Adept does. Uh, increases special weapon scaling. So that's kind of important. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to come by ways to boost elemental damage in this game, and uh, special weapon scaling is, is one of those ways. Let's take a look at that magma mall. Forged in the volcanoes of their homeworld, Kron weapons are infused with the primordial power of Bigor. Modified for use by mortals, these mauls have specifically, specially, sorry, insulated handles to prevent the wielder from burning or catching on fire. You know, I feel like not enough fantasy settings address that. We're not going to be using the magma maul, but it's nice that they wrapped it in like a rubber handle that doesn't conduct heat. Clans of lava worms are harvested and refined to create the signature fiery ammunition of the Kron. Certain handguns are customized to unleash barrages of incendiary rounds, setting unprotected targets ablaze. The volcanic ballista is one of the more useful pistols in the game, I found. 
specifically because, yeah, setting people on fire is pretty great. But, uh, we've got our Viridian shotgun, so I, I think we'll be, uh, I think we'll be fine without it. You'll have to forgive me for not showing off a lot of these weapons, mostly just reading their description and stuff. It's, it's just that there are so many damn weapons in this game, and, and so many different there are so many different ways to approach weapons and weapon handling in this game that I don't really have time or room to to wield all of them. <laughs> We're picking up a lot more guns than I could use in one playthrough, which is cool. I like that. But of course, headshots with the Imperial Executor, Executor, headshots with a sniper rifle do pretty good on these guys, even though their weak point is on their back. The Viridian shotgun is also quite useful, though, because uh, we're going to be dodging and dipping and ducking and diving, so might as well get some close-range deadliness out of it, I guess. So this is the point at which I have decided to spec my character into sniper rifles, because in the end game of... Oh, hey, a shrine. This seems a little bit suspicious. In the endgame of Immortal Unchained, uh, doing a lot of damage in the fewest amount of shots becomes kind of important. So, sniper rifles are the best way to go about that, especially for a Let's Play. So, let's just try not to set off any traps here. And armor up! But of course we have to get pretty first. I mean... You know, Arden is nice and frosty this time of year. Maybe we should make ourselves nice and frosty. Blend in with the snow this way. Oh! Now that's a bonus. So syringes granting more health is always appreciated. Especially because the locals are apparently upset that we use that shrine. But they'll get over it. They'll get over it in the afterlife. Or, I guess for them it would be the after afterlife. So yeah, the Viridian shotgun and one-handed shotguns in general, uh, or side-grade shotguns, I guess, are really useful in this game for just doing a, like, a single blat blat for big damage in one shot on an enemy's weak point. Uh, unfortunately, the normal two-handed auto shotguns are not good at that. The, they they don't do nearly as much damage as the single-shot varieties, which is sad. It's 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 a real shame. Like with with a couple exce uh, exceptions, the shotguns in this game kind of suck, which which is fine, I guess, because they have enough good ones, but. It, it still is a bummer for me, a shotgun aficionado. These big guys also have the problem of being made of essentially solid oak, and uh, you can't you can't knock them over like you can some enemies. So in this game, if you stumble an enemy by removing all of their stamina and you shoot them in the body uh, to to deal that final hit. It'll knock them on their ass, and then you can get a free hit on them. But not these guys, they're too tall. Cut into the heart of Arden was a kingdom for wandering souls. The gloom of the abyss is a reflection of the inner darkness of its ruler. You may recall that the the ruler, of course, is Iska, Queen of the Dead. And uh, as we step over these frozen skulls and rib cages and stuff, I think you can probably see why this is where she made her domain. There's a lot of corpses around here. Also, a new enemy type. For how cold Arden is, apparently this guy would like to turn up the heat a little bit, but he can't find the thermostat. At close range, these guys are extremely dangerous, but at long range, they're not so bad. Unfortunately, since, since that ambush thing happened at the end of the last video, uh, when we revisit an area, we will now occasionally be ambushed by these green cyber orbs. 
that carry a million enemies with them every time. Honestly, that fire guy's not so bad when he's just mano a mano one on one. The problem comes when there's more than one, which... Oh, you'll see. That comes into play later. Gatekeeper sub gun. It looks kind of like a nail gun. Or, or like the... Or like the SMG from Quake. Maybe that's why it's called the Gatekeeper sub gun. Man, I really like the design of this place. The, this place just looks evil. I would not like to have my corpse embalmed here. I don't know. Nothing seems right about this. Especially not this riot club. Oh, hey! Look! We picked up enough protocols to actually open one of these. <laughs> okay. Boy, that, that lock shot off with force. That must have been on there tight. <laughs> but hey! Th hey, look! We're actually exploring behind the scenes a little bit, and it looks even gribblier back here. I really like this. I really like this aesthetic of this place. Of like, like, it's like H.R. Giger and like an 80s fantasy comic had a baby together, and that baby, that baby has lore for us to pick up. Nalon lived his life as a servant to the Prime's cause, always putting his people's needs before his own. He died as he lived, a defender of Prime values. I guess that's a good thing. The the prime may have been uh Oh my. Okay, this place looks even more evil than the place we were just standing in. The prime may have been a bit hoity-toity and authoritarian, but they seem all right. I mean, you know, just trying to uphold the greater good. It's just that Maybe they had kind of a strict idea of what the greater good actually is. So we've heard about these things before in previous, uh, in, in previous lore, uh, lore pickups. Th these are the, the soul furnaces, as the area title stated, where the armies of the dead are manufactured from corpses and wayward souls to make horrible... Nightmare abominations that serve the Queen of the Dead. Oh boy. Also, there are teleporting people. Hello. What a nightmare. So these guys, of course, have cryo weapons which slow us down if we get hit by them, which makes it easier for us, for us to get hit by more attacks. Which is really cool. Really cool combination of stuff they have there. I am... Out of healing syringes. <laughs> I am very far from home right now. Out of healing syringes, and now I'm relying on the TRM syringes, which is not ever a good thing. So this is a little side path you unlock, and it's one of the only side paths we can unlock on the way to it. The rest of them, you usually only get the protocols afterward, and, uh, there's lots of lore to pick up on the way. The screams of sundered souls are sure to induce madness in any living mind. No mortal has ever endured the horrors of the abyss. Well, it is a good thing that we are both immortal and unchained, because this Queen of the Dead lady, we need to have a few words with her. Anyway, the soul furnaces are our next destination. But, uh, we're not actually there yet. This shortcut, as I said, is one of the only ones you can unlock early. And it leads us to an alternate entrance to the soul furnaces themselves. But we don't want to go to the soul furnaces yet. We're not, we're not quite ready for that. We haven't even found our way all the way through the catacombs. We, we got quite a long ways to go. Uh... But it is a really handy shortcut, and the funny thing is, it almost seems like this is the way that you are intended to enter this area. Because it starts you at the bottom, and you get a nice, big overview of the cauldrons. Listen to that ominous music. 
The infinite imagination of their queen provide the undead with ever new forms. Parts are stitched together and fused with rusted metal and armaments, creating a wide variety of servants and the rest of that, whatever that said. Boy. That sounds like horror. <laughs> let's not let's not deal with body horror until we have to. But yeah, I guess when you have an in, an infinity number of corpses to work with, uh, you can pretty much do mad science until you create whatever you want. I really like the way that the the zombie army feels. It's it's very very patchwork, very uh, very painful looking. I mean. Like, you gotta wonder what the hell were these guys before they were zombies? Because, I mean, they don't really look human. But maybe that's because they were transformed into cyber zombies? Like, maybe these were people and now they're not because they've just been messed with so much? I don't know. Either way, they're everywhere and I don't like it. Excuse me. Pardon me. So it would have been a good idea to go back and use the obelisk or uh, teleport back to it. But I didn't want to have to fight all those enemies again. So I just walked back from the shortcut and that was what that camera cut was. But that means that I am relying entirely on TRM syringes until we get to the next obelisk, which is frightening. Oh, hey there. It's, it's frightening because there's no way to stop poison in this game. You just have to wait for it to run out. So there's only a limited number of times I can get poisoned by these guys before it becomes a problem. Thankfully, the sniper rifle on headshot now does enough damage to kill these, these losers in one hit. So I think we're doing fine. The Queen of the Dead wandered the frozen and desolate source surface of Arden for decades. Excuse me. Exiled for the crimes of her father, betrayed and abandoned. Yes. So, this is the beginning of humanizing, in a way, of some of the foes that we are going to be facing in the endgame of Immortal Unchained. You see, this is sort of a story, almost, about how good intentions can turn one evil. Uh, about how... Someone who starts pure can be corrupted by the forces of darkness. Like, oh, I don't know, someone who came to be known as the Queen of the Dead. You're going to find that theme here and there within the end stages of Immortal Unchained about how anything and everything, good, evil, or otherwise, can become corrupted uh, or otherwise be, I don't know, made upset by things out of their control happening to them? Your fate being thrust upon you, essentially. Be being a, a pawn in someone else's game and, and not even knowing it and all that kind of stuff. That's going to be a recurring theme going forward. What have we here? The echoing corridors of the Charnels are what welcome the souls that arrive at the Abyss. Through them, souls are ferried deeper into the Underworld. I find it interesting that the concept of a soul is like just a real thing in this world. And like the, the idea of the, the the river sticks ferrying souls into the great hereafter is represented as a literal planet in the solar system. <laughs> it's kinda it's kinda crazy. I wonder who built all of this in the first place. I wonder if it was if it if all of this is due to Iska. There's all kinds of lore that we haven't read. I, I, we've been picking up enemy, uh, we, we, we've been picking up enemy insignias and they're called, I think, like, necrotaphs or something like that. That give you a lot, a lot, a lot of lore on the foes we're facing. Maybe I'll, uh, may, maybe I'll show those off at some point. We got a lot of different, uh, got a lot of different ciphers here. So some of which are more useful than others. Uh, here in the second phase of Arden, there are a whole hell of a lot of um, of ciphers just lying around. It's it's kind of strange, but uh, 
there are some that are very, very useful here. Excuse me. One of which is, of course, husk, which reduces the uh, acid damage we take. And that's really useful for this entire area. Now, we're going to unequip Predator for now, because I would rather beef up my assault rifle, because, I mean, it fires a little bit faster than the sniper. And hey, speaking of assault rifles, it's the Great Predator's Lancer. The most fierce, reputable hunters of D-Gun usually use venomous ammunition to weaken their prey. Boy, I can't read today, or ever. Taking down even the largest and most dangerous creatures. Staying true to their forefathers, these big game hunters still use original weapons, with little room for additional attachments. And yeah, that's pretty much true, because... I mean, that's just an assault rifle. That's just a real-life assault rifle. The Great Predator Sharp Rifle. Grizzled Deganite Big Game Hunters use customized sharp rifles with corrosive rounds and effective silencers to take out the most dangerous prey without attracting the attention of beasts lurking nearby. Again, I don't think silencers actually do anything in this game. <laughs> And of course, the Gatekeeper Subgun. Once they reach adulthood, the Azurians are presented with the choice to receive military training and serve as soldiers. One of the first thing these soldiers master is the art of combat mobility. Using light submachine guns loaded with radiant rounds, they are taught to outmaneuver their opponents to strike at their weak spots. Now this, this has pretty high requirements, but the Gatekeeper subgun is one of the more useful submachine guns in the game. Because it, uh, it fires energy, energy rounds, so we're gonna keep it. Because who knows, someday we might use it. The Riot Club is a big old beaten stick. The Wardens often use human weapons in power with prime technology. Blunt weapons are utif utilized by law enforcement agencies on Apexion, when lethal force is not immediately authorized. <laughs> I like the way that's phrased. It's not immediately authorized. Just looking around for other stuff that we can, you know, we can put on here. It's, uh, it's worth customizing a little bit because, I mean, it's like I said, I don't have enough room to show off everything, but I do want to get a good variety of equipment. Because one thing I like about this game is that pretty much everything is useful at some point. Speaking of useful, we are going to be pumping some points into our insight. Because, uh, wielding elemental weapons in the endgame is quite important. <laughs> Enemies get a lot of resistance to physical damage as this game goes on. <laughs> so we're gonna want to prepare appropriately for that. I really like the way this game presents death. I I like the just the entire computerized aspect of it where you can you can the the idea of a soul in this universe is equated to storing a person in bits and bytes of data. I I like that I liked it pretty much everything in this game. Oh hey there. <laughs> Pretty much everything in this game can be whittled down into being a reference to computer stuff, essentially, <laughs> for for lack of a more elegant way to phrase it. And and I find that really interesting. They they really really work the metaphor into it, which is cool. Azurian souls are rare and highly coveted by the Queen of the Dead. When captured, these souls are used exclusively for the commanders of her armies. Well, it seems that the Queen of the Dead has a lot of armies up her sleeveies, given the number of coffins and skulls and souls and all kinds of nice stuff around here. Man, those locks are shooting off with force today. Oh! Oh, we could just open this. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah, that's a hell portal. I don't want to go in there. That that seems like an absolute nightmare. Maybe some other time, thank you. 
I'm, I'm not interested in hell today. I, I prefer the weather being nice and frosty as opposed to uh, setting my setting my hair on fire. I like the charnels as an area. It's it's very tight and claustrophobic. Uh, a lot of the fighting in this game, unfortunately, I, I would say unfortunately because uh, it's uh, I, I think this game could use more wide open spaces to fight in. Uh, Hold that thought. Always eager to prove herself worthy to her masters. Many of Bren's fellow wardens found her attempts to please the Prime vain and distasteful. Well, that's some pretty important lore on a friend of ours. I hope we get the chance to talk to her about that because that's kind of important to the whole, you know, remembering who she was kind of thing. Sprawling catacombs designed to house the empty and unused bodies of the deceased. Rumors say they stretch beneath the surface of this world, from one end to another. So that's, that is, that ties into the whole, the soul is a real ass thing in this universe concept. The idea that when you die, your soul leaves your body and goes to the cyber afterlife, and then the rest of you just stays. Like, like your your physical body stays behind while your soul leaves and then they just have to do something with it like something has to be done with your body because it's just sitting there it's weird like you you go you got to assume just by default that the characters in this universe are humans right but they're not really <laughs> that's that's something that i think is worth reminding you of is that the characters in this game are not humans Except for, like, I guess people like Bren, for example. But even then, we just found out that Bren is not a person specifically. <laughs> like, they're human-shaped. They act like humans. But as we learned in Viridian, the humans are gone. The, they're, the humans have been gone a very long time. <laughs> like, it's, it's really strange to think about. Anyway, as I was saying... I like the design of the catacombs. The the charnels is a really interesting area because it's like enemies that enemies that excel at at taking people on with wide sweeps in tight and closed hallways. What do you do when you have no choice but to fight them in those types of areas? Like that I I think that's a really cool gameplay challenge and it's cool that they built an area entirely around it. So let's maybe not step on the floor because I don't really like the I don't I don't like the implications of those raised bits. So let's maybe be very very careful not to oh I don't know trigger any Indiana Jones style traps on ourselves. Just remember Jehovah is spelled with an I. Ugh! Okay, so that's what happens if you step on the floor panels. Let's not do that anymore. Let's not do that, especially not while I'm standing on them. So you can burn the enemies alive if you if you trigger it while they're standing on it. But for some reason, they don't seem to take damage if they walk into it afterward. Like, they have to be standing on it when you activate it to be set on fire, I think. And I don't think they can trigger them themselves. Also, that was bullshit. That should have been a, a hit on his weak spot. Whatever, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Hey, hey. Nice sniper rifle. I'll take it. I guess the one thing I do wish that this game went into a little bit more when it comes to the lore is... Uh... Oh, hey there is is what human life was like on this kind of a place you know like you, you gotta wonder how normal people survived in this kind of a world apparently they lived on viridian where you know there are man-eating poison plants and vines that drag you down to the depths of murky water and strangle you to death 
this just seems like a very hostile place to live. There's planets that are just lava, planets where corpses are dumped by the thousand. It... It doesn't seem like a very livable existence. But I guess we just don't know much about it. And, you know, the thing is, I haven't actually really browsed through these cenotaphs. Uh, cenotaphs is what they're called. I called them necrotaphs earlier. Um, I haven't really browsed through these cenotaphs because there are one or two for every enemy in the game. So there's a lot of them to collect. And maybe they go into it a little bit more. But... I would be interested to know just how a normal person would live their life in this kind of a universe. Leaders of the Prime traveled to the Abyss to reclaim the soul of their favorite son following his death. Their request was promptly denied by the Queen, for Nalon's soul had become her most prized possession. Now, now that's important. You you keep that in mind going forward, that, that this Nalon fellow that we heard about earlier is quite important to the Prime. Now, now Nalon is, um... Nalon is a name that's going to come up quite a lot going forward. Uh, we're, we're going to learn about how this Nalon fellow and their quest to reclaim him is part of the reason that the Prime and the zombie folk don't really like each other. Other than the whole, you know, zombie folk are inherently hostile to everyone in the world kind of thing in all forms of media. But we'll, we'll just forget about that part and focus on what's relevant to Immortal Unchained. Speaking of relevant, it's a good thing that I showed you the Soul Furnace earlier. Otherwise, this vista may have been a little bit shocking to see. Because yes, indeed. I'll see you next time, when the Soul Furnace is our next destination.